Um, I trust people were able to, uh, to see that. Um, I'm now going to uh, switch over to our slideshow and share that with you. So um, the uh, Aaron Bailey program is now in its 12th year and uh, now has a distinguished history with um, speakers from um, all over the world, uh, many uh, uh, prestigious institutions. Um, and um, yeah, it's not just a lecture. Um, every year we've tried to use this event to uh, accomplish um, something. Uh, we used it to launch the Colorado crisis system, introduce scientists to survivors, uh, present the national research agenda, uh, provide QPR training, um, and so forth. Uh, so each year we try to have this, this lecture uh, become uh, the beginning of the action uh, that will reduce suicide in Colorado. Uh, this year is no different. Um, we're going to be talking about benzodiazepine exposure and suicide risk in Colorado, and the program will be in two parts. Um, we have with us Dr. Christy Huff, who is a cardiologist and director of the Benzodiazepine Information Coalition, who will talk to us about uh, her experience with benzodiazepines and uh, suicide risk. Uh, Barbara Gabella, who's a senior epidemiologist at CDPHE, will provide data from um, the Colorado systems uh, about exposure to benzodiazepines and benzodiazepines uh, in suicide decedents. Uh, and then executive director of uh, CDPHE, uh, Jill Ryan, will um, talk to us about some policy options um, that could be pursued uh, to begin to address the problem. Uh, executive director Ryan has 20 years of experience at the state and local level in public health. She served two terms as Eagle County Commissioner um, and served as the uh, director of the State Office of Health Equity uh, before becoming executive director at CDPHE. Uh, her career is focused on health equity, affordable health care, environmental protection, climate action, uh, emergency preparedness, uh, and increasing mental health resources. So it's a great uh, pleasure to have her and uh, her staff here with us today uh, at the beginning of this. Part two will be a stakeholder meeting uh, led by our own uh, Dr. Alexis Ridfo, who is an assistant professor in the department and um, director of the Addiction Fellowship. Um, she'll have with her uh, Jeffrey Gold uh, from the VA uh, and Rob Valak from uh, the Departments of Pharmacy, Epidemiology and Family uh, Medicine uh, to help her uh, brainstorm about uh, what we might do um, to tackle this problem. Um, I have the grim task of telling you that uh, suicide is going to increase in Colorado. Um, we had uh, 1,246 deaths uh, in 2018. 2019 numbers are not available yet. Uh, we continue uh, to be um, number seven in the country, I think, with a rate significantly higher uh, than the rest of the U.S. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention at least how COVID-19 might interact uh, with suicide. The truth is that uh, suicide can actually go down in disasters, uh, and so we may experience um, a decline, at least uh, in the beginning, uh, but then uh, we expect that the rate may go back up again uh, as a result of any economic downturn. Um, and you can learn more about that in this week's uh, Mind the Brain uh, with Dr. Epperson. So why benzodiazepines and suicide risk? Um, it, there are many reasons why um, suicidal people are exposed to benzodiazepines. Uh, sometimes they simply do it as part of an overdose. Uh, they may use alcohol or sedatives to assist with an attempt. They may be less inhibited as a result of taking benzodiazepines um, and more likely to make an attempt. 
uh, or it could simply be that they have problems um, for which they're being treated that are related to suicide. This is called confounding by indication. Um, and so anxiety and insomnia are associated with benzodiazepines. They're also associated with suicide and that might create a, a spurious uh, correlation uh, with suicide. So we have to keep that in mind um, as others on the program present the data. Uh, it's also true that the American Psychiatric Association has recommended uh, the use of benzodiazepines for in severe insomnia, agitation, uh, panic attacks, and psychic anxiety in suicidal patients. Um, thinking of it as sort of a quick way to reduce suffering and inspire hope in suicidal people. Um, and so, uh, although they recommend the use of long-acting agents on a short-term basis, um, it has been uh, a part of the management of suicidal people. So not surprisingly, uh, as you'll see uh, as we go on through the program, uh, benzodiazepines are frequently found uh, in um, suicides, uh, and we'd like to understand and, um, uh, and be prepared to um, uh, do something about that. So at this point, I'll turn the program over to Dr. Huff, who's director of the Benzodiazepine Information Coalition. Hi, um, so I'm gonna be talking about my benzodiazepine story just to give you a little bit of context when I talk about benzodiazepines as they relate to suicide. Um, and that will include my lived experience and also observations um, from working with the benzodiazepine um, survivor community. Um, and I'll just give some, what I see as things that could help prevent suicide in this patient population. So um, who I am, I wear many hats. First and foremost, I'm a mom. Um, I put there that I'm a breast cancer survivor. Just to give you a little context, um, how I, um, my cancer was nothing compared to what I suffered on benzodiazepines, just to give you that perspective. And, you know, I'm a survivor now of injury from benzodiazepines that were taken as prescribed. And subsequently, I became an advocate for benzodiazepine awareness and with Benzodiazepine Information Coalition. And um, this picture just shows me with my family before, um, before I was um, suffered adverse effects from the benzodiazepines. Okay, next. Um, so in August of 2015, I was prescribed Xanax up to take three times a day, 0.5 milligrams as needed during a health crisis. And at first I just took 0.25 milligrams at night for sleep, but you know, I didn't wanna take more than I needed to. Um, Three weeks later, I developed a tremor and um, new anxiety, worse than any kind of anxiety that I've ever had in my life. Um, and at first, in, none of my doctors said anything about the Xanax being a problem. Um, I was being assessed for a medical disorder or some kind of neurologic problem. I had multiple medical tests, all were normal. And during that time, my Xanax dose was increased up to milligrams per day to treat this worsening anxiety. Um, encouraged both by my medical providers and my family as well. Um, next slide. So it got to the point where Xanax doses were lasting me two to three hours, and then I would be in full-blown withdrawal. I would develop muscle spasticity, difficulty breathing and swallowing, couldn't sleep, full of terror. Um, it was absolutely awful. And but still nobody knew exactly what was going on. Um, I finally figured out Xanax was the problem when I was asked to hold it for a, a medical test. Um, and to, to severe symptoms resolved with taking um, Xanax just with a matter of minutes. And you know, I now know I was suffering from interdose withdrawal. Um, I never took more than prescribed. I never craved the Xanax. So this was, was not an addiction problem. You know, I was taking it to treat anxiety. It was prescribed to me. And um, later on, I was taking it solely to prevent withdrawal symptoms. And um, what I was experiencing were the normal physiologic consequences of taking Xanax, physiologic dependence, tolerance, and interdose withdrawal. Um, so I transitioned to Valium to taper and um, 
the taper took over three years to complete. It was a harrowing experience. I was um, sick the whole time. Sorry, I just need a little transition here before I go into the suicide bit. I was incredibly ill the entire time, multiple symptoms. And one of my symptoms was suicidal ideation. Um, and so I just made a list for you here of reasons that I think benzodiazepines are like linked to suicide. And this is drawing from my experience and also the experience of others that we follow in the benzodiazepine harmed community. Um, you know, first it's a side effect of the drug. It, that's reported in the literature, that's well known. But it's also uh, suicidal ideation is a withdrawal symptom. And I experienced that during my taper. Um, another aspect is the, the relentless nature of benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome. Some people are suffering years. I mean, like for me, I, I tapered over three years and was sick the entire time. And then next is a lack of understanding and support. So I'll talk a little bit in more detail about um, my withdrawal. Um, suicidal ideation specifically was a sign that I was tapering too quickly. So if I cut too much of my dose or I went too fast, then I, you know, I got into trouble and I would have random strong urges to harm myself. And I mean, they were very specific, like go get a knife, go to the kitchen and, you know, stab yourself. And I, these, it was like something coming from outside of my brain. And I, um, I fortunately had the insight to know that this was from the drug and the drug taper. So I did not act on these urges. I mean, I, I wanted to live, I wanted to be healthy again. Um, and these urges subsided by month three after the taper was complete. So I, I knew this was all related to the taper. So, and another aspect is the relentless nature of the symptoms. Um, for me, this and many others, it was a 24 seven torture that goes on for years on end. And, you know, I became weary from the severity and persistence of these symptoms. Um, I had despair from not knowing if things would ever get better. And, you know, I fought every minute for four years to get off the drug, had little quality of life. And really the hope of returning my daughter was the only thing that kept me alive. Um, today I'm 14 months off the drug. And if I hadn't gotten better, you know, that level of suffering that I was enduring with the taper was not sustainable in the long term. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the next piece of the puzzle is lack of support for these patients. You know, I was lucky I had a supportive physician and supportive family, uh, but there's a lack of awareness across the board in the medical community and the public about um, the existence of benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome and exactly how severe and lengthy the process can be. And that translates into a lack of resources for treating and supporting these patients. And since this you know, quote, doesn't exist, patients are often abandoned by their friends, their family members, even their doctors. And so we have a whole group of patients in turning online to support out of necessity. They have nowhere else to go. So I just assembled a quick list of ways I feel we could help prevent suicide uh, from where, I, from my observations in the benzo community. So first, prescriber education. Um, just based on what I'm seeing with the Benzo Coalition and also um, what I know that I was trained in medical school, the prescriber education is lacking um, in the areas of adverse effects with benzodiazepines. And this is leading to patients not being believed when they come to their doctors saying they're suffering effects from the drug. Um, the other piece of the puzzle on the front end is we need to have cautious prescribing of these drugs, if there's an alternative that exists, then that should be used first. Um, informed consent is extremely important. Patients need to know what they're getting into. And I would even consider written informed consent uh, because these drugs carry serious risks. Um, I know we're gonna be talking about a deprescribing clinic in the next hour, which I think is wonderful. And um, I would really advocate for a patient-driven symptom-based taper, um, I recommend starting low and go slow. And what does slow mean? Uh, it basically, as long as it takes, the patient should control the speed uh, to keep symptoms as tolerable as possible. And um, 
And, you know, when we're doing this, you definitely should seek input from patients who have suffered uh, because they're going to know, you know, what, what they need to be supported. So, um, and so I just leave this with you. My daughter and I got to go to Disneyland over spring break before all this COVID stuff hit. And um, I just leave this to say that I'm one of the lucky ones. I survived um, some of the other people that we follow and the Pinza community are not so lucky. They, they lose their lives for the reasons that I mentioned. So thanks for letting me share today. Thank you, Christy. Um, you know, one thing you didn't mention, you know, which um, I a little surprised is, is whether people should be prescribed uh, these medicines at all. Uh, and that's one of the things that we'll, uh, we'll be talking about probably in the second hour are uh, guidelines for the appropriate use. Um, now, um, uh, Ms. Barbara uh, Gabella is going to talk to us about the frequency of benzodiazepine exposure um, in people who died by suicide in Colorado. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to thank you. I feel very honored to join this group and to tell you about an exploratory analysis that we did last summer. Next slide, please. First, I'm going to describe our analysis of benzodiazepine exposure among all residents. We use the Colorado Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. That's a database of controlled substances on the DEA schedules two through five. Each record represents a prescription. And this database cannot tell us information about any medical diagnosis or the reason the provider prescribed the medication. And it does not capture, of course, if a patient took medication dispensed as prescribed. Benzodiazepines is the second most common class of controlled substances pres prescribed and dispensed in Colorado. And you can see that it, the number of prescriptions have been decreasing over this time period from under 2 million prescriptions down to 1.5 million prescriptions in 2018. The age-adjusted prescription fill rate for benzodiazepines has also been decreasing over the same five-year period. The, den the benzodiazepine trend line is the middle line in orange. And it turns out that short-acting benzodiazepines are prescribed at a higher age-adjusted fill rate over this time period. And both short-acting and long-acting have been decreasing. And then at the health department, we also track the percent of patient days with overlapping opioid and benzodiazepines because this can put you at higher risk for fatal opioid overdose. So in summary, benzodiazepines are the second most dispensed drug class in Colorado. And what I didn't show is that it represents about 20% of the controlled substances dispensed to Colorado residents. The percent of prescription days with overlapping opioid and benzodiazepine prescriptions has decreased. And again, I didn't show the last two bullets, but physicians prescribe about 55% of all benzodiazepine prescriptions dispensed during this period, and the prescription fill rates increase with increasing age and are higher among women than men. So now I'll show you the next analysis that we did, 
where we looked at benzodiazepine exposure among people who died by suicide using the databases and data available to us. So keep in mind the confounding information that Dr. Allen provided previously. This slide just reminds me to tell you it was a team effort. That's okay. You can keep going, Alan. You're, you're pacing really well with me. Thank you. <laughs> Next slide. And we were trying to explore answering two questions. Is there a biologic, a plausible biologic mechanism of benzodiazepines that would increase suicidal ideation? And then what did possible exposure look like? State toxicology staff at our health department reviewed the literature, but I should caution you, it was not a systematic review. And from the literature that they looked at, they found that there was more than one plausible biologic mechanism whereby benzodiazepines might increase suicidal ideation. And this just gives you a flavor of some of the diverse literature they looked at. So our purpose was to look at this from a population health perspective and to answer a very basic question. Does the number and pattern of benzodiazepine use among people who die by suicide suggest further investigation? The methods we used for this exploratory analysis last summer was that we linked the PDMP prescription data to death certificates. Then we selected deaths by suicide. And of those linked records, we then linked them to the Colorado Violent Death Reporting System to obtain postmortem toxicology results. We identified that there were 3,465 deaths by suicide in 2015 through 2017. And then the bottom line shows you the look back period. So everyone had at least one year period prior to death in which we searched for a benzodiazepine prescription to that person. But some people had almost four years. So keep that in mind when I talk about ever exposed benzodiazepines. And here are the results. We identified 3,465 suicide deaths, and they represent 100% of all suicide deaths during this period. We linked almost 2,000 or over 2,000 deaths to the PDMP, and those deaths represent 60% of all suicide deaths during 2015 to 2017. And then we looked at exposure specifically to benzodiazepine. So over a thousand persons had ever had a benzodiazepine dispensed during that look back period. And that represents 30% of all suicide deaths. And then we also were interested in recent benzodiazepine exposure. And we defined that as a benzodiazepine dispensed within 30 days prior to death or a positive toxicology screen post-mortem. And 699 person who, persons who died by suicide had a recent exposure. And that represents 20% of all suicide deaths. Does this differ for people who died by another cause during that same period? And it turns out the answer is no. So of all the deaths during 2015 to 2017 that weren't due to suicide, 78% of those death certificates linked to the PDMP and 47% 
had a benzodiazepine during the look back period. We also looked at the circumstances prior to death by suicide, and we used the information from the Colorado Violent Death Reporting System. We looked at three types of circumstances, uh, whether the person had a contributing physical health problem, a known mental health problem, and a known alcohol or substance abuse problem. And here are the results. Focus on the orange bars. Those represent the people who did have one of the three problems or conditions. And then the height of the orange bars tells us the percentage that had a benzodiazepine exposure. And notice that the orange bars are higher than the blue bars. The blue bars represent people who died by suicide during the three-year period, but did not have that condition. And the height of the blue bars tells you their exposure or the percent percentage of people that were exposed to benzodiazepines. And there's two sets because we define that this is ever having been dispensed to benzodiazepine during the look back period or recent exposure within 30 days or a positive tox screen. So again, for either measure, people that had one of these conditions and died by suicide, a larger percentage were exposed to benzodiazepines. I've mentioned some of these as well as the confounding issues that Dr. Allen raised, the key thing is the last point that we did not have a comparison group. So we could not assess risk. This is just a summary slide. So I just wanna thank you again for your attention during this. Barbara, if you would, can you just take a moment and walk this uh, walk us through the summary? Oh, okay. So again, we asked very basic questions. Is there a biologic mechanism that is plausible that would suggest that benzodiazepines increase suicidal ideation? And the answer was yes. There's at least four possible biologic mechanisms. Is there exposure? The answer is yes, there is exposure, both among people who died by suicide and people who did not. And then is it causal? And that's the question we cannot answer with our population databases. Okay. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. So at this point, um, we'll begin to talk about um, the action part of the agenda. And we're happy to have um, Jill Ryan, the executive director of CDPHD, here to talk about the uh, policy issues that, uh, that this leads us into. Uh, Jill, I think we're doing well on time. So uh, feel free to go into these um, uh, to your heart's content. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll just um, make a few comments here real fast. I want to uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in the Aaron Bailey Memorial Suicide Prevention Lecture. Um, and I want to thank Christy Huff for sharing her lived experience with us. I first um, became really interested in exploring the potential link between benzodiazepines and suicidality about a year ago um, when a fellow Eagle County resident and colleague, someone I had known a long time, um, John State, was a great advocate, contacted me to share his experience and story. And um, I think that we uh, spent about three hours together and um, 
And I was really um, intrigued and just felt the need to, to get involved and use my new position as um, director of the Department of Public Health and Environment to see how we could push a policy agenda. Um, at the time, Governor Polis had just made one of his top priorities, reducing Colorado's suicide rate. Uh, he calls this a WIG, a wildly important goal, and he's given each agency uh, three or four wildly important goals. Um, so I asked my staff to do a comprehensive review of data and research on suicide and suicide prevention strategies. So we reviewed and mapped current department efforts and identified new opportunities for engagement with other state agencies and local partners. Um, and it definitely struck me how little uh, research we came across that looked at the association between benzodiazepines and, and suicide. Um, and to our knowledge, really the data that Barbara Gabella just presented was the first time a state health department has linked data from the National Violent Death Reporting System to prevention drug um, monitor monitoring program data. And while there's still so much we need to learn about the um, benzodiazepine suicide connection, state and federal government should actively be exploring policy levers that can impact prescribing to address the possibility that withdrawal or abrupt tapering may elevate the risk of suicide. Um, so going to this slide, uh, the use and, pot and potential for abuse of benzodiazepines has drawn the attention of state policymakers in the past. In 1989, amid fears of addiction to this family of drugs, New York State moved to regulate benzodiazepine prescriptions and enacted strict rules around prescribing. A few states followed suit. A second wave of policy attention occurred in the 1990s and the first decade of the 21st century when family advocates became concerned about the overprescription of these drugs for older adults and the sedating and amnesiastic uh, effects they could have. I tripped over that word, didn't I? Uh, they're also concerned that they um, increase the risk of falls, motor vehicle accidents, and other injuries. Policymakers responded by calling for informed consent procedures around prescribing and guidelines related to their prescribing these medications for older adults. Because of their deadly interactions with opioids, these drugs have again drawn attention from policymakers. To date, 15 states have enacted laws or promulg promulgated regulations related to the co-prescribing of opioids and benzodiazepines. In addition, in 2016, the US Food and Drug Administration added warnings to drug labeling regarding co-prescribing of opioids and benzodiazepines. The goal of these policies was to reduce concern themselves with the risk of addiction, accidental overdose, or dangerous interactions between drug classes. Uh, next slide, please. CDPHE is committed to exploring policy options that could address the dangers of benzodiazepines and possibly reduce suicide. Over the last several months, I've had the opportunity to meet members of the Colorado Behavioral Health Task Force, the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices, um, Benzo Free Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention, and others to brainstorm different education and policy options to help reduce the behavioral health risks associated with benzodiazepine use. Um, and the department really does look forward to partnerships with these groups as we go forward on a policy agenda together. So these are some of the ideas that came up during these meetings um, that the department fully supports. Um, promote funding and research on adverse outcomes. Um, so a, a meta-analysis or systematic review of the impact of benzodiazepine on suicide risks. Um, number two, support robust benzo education for patients and prescribers. Co-prescribing benzodiazepines and opioids is now a well-known risk for overdose. Over the last four years, CDPHE has partnered with the School of Medicine and the School of Par Pharmacy to reduce co-prescribing. But benzodiazepines on their own are a controlled substance and pose long-term risks. We need to do more robust um, prescribing and de-prescribing education, and so slow tapering, 
for providers. We also need to increase public awareness about the risks associated with these drugs for patients and families. Um, we support piloting and evaluating deprescribing clinics uh, so patients get the support they need. Um, and explore policy options. For example, uh, the Colorado General Assembly has passed a number of important measures over the last couple of years aimed at curbing overprescribing of opioids and reducing overdose deaths. So it's time for Colorado to explore sim similar strategies to prevent adverse health outcomes associated with benzodiazepines. Um, some, er some ideas to explore may include uh, prescribing limits to encourage less than four weeks of use, um, educational requirements for prescribers, informed consent for patients considering taking opioids, require prescribers to check the prescription drug monitoring program before prescribing. Um, and I'll just say that we would not go forward with any of these uh, policy options without working with our partners and um, having a policy agenda that we all agree on and want to move forth with. So CDPHE is really looking forward to collaborating with the Department of Psych uh, Psychiatry and uh, really appreciate everyone who is on this, um, this Zoom meeting today. And um, thanks so much for joining us and look forward to the conversation. So um, at this point, um, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Alexis Ritbo, who um, has looked for similar data in our own uh, databases um, and who will be leading some of the efforts from our side uh, that um, Executive Director Ryan was, was just talking about. Um, and I think that after she... Um, uh, introduces the second part of the program. We'll have time for uh, questions and answers uh, and then take a, a quick break and move into the second hour. Um, Alexis? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Allen. So my name is Dr. Alexis Ritvo. I am addiction psychiatrist in the Department of Psychiatry and um, will soon be assuming the uh, fellowship directorship for addiction psychiatry. Um, I think it's important to reiterate, as um, Dr. Huff shared, that you know majority of these patients do not meet criteria for addiction, but they do have physical dependence, which is why um, they often end up in the wheelhouse of addiction specialists. Um, and this has been something that has interested me um, even before I, I fell into addiction um, training, but as a, a chief resident in in our outpatient clinic here, where I'll where I now supervise. Um, residents, psychiatry residents. Um, so utilizing the tools we have available, which are imperfect um, for sure, and now require, you know, some further, um, um, uh, I think, look, you know, further looks to look at, at what this data actually means. But I just went ahead and within our um, medical record system, looked for individuals that were seen in outpatient psychiatry in the year 2019, how many had had a benzodiazepine on their medication list at some point. So, you know, important caveat is that some of these may be appropriately prescribed in short term. Um, I will say, though, having done this back in 2017, it was a very similar percentage. Um, as you see, 31.6% in outpatient psychiatry versus 16.3% um, uh, in medicine. Um, and I'm not surprised about that, given that um, psychiatry, you know, this is a medication that is, has, has indications for psychiatric treatments of insomnia and anxiety short term. Um, and also that people that are struggling with those things get, get referred to us in psychiatry, um, often already on these medications um, when they're no longer working, have built tolerance um, or need to, you know, try alternative treatments, including uh, um, psychotherapy, um, which is, you know, a longstanding, well evidence-based treatment for those. Um, you know, also wanted to point out that the, 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 that co-prescribing of the, the opiates is extremely high um, in outpatient psychiatry 
um, up to 13.7% had had both an opioid and a benzodiazepine on their list at some point. Um, again, doesn't mean that they weren't shortly prescribed, but certainly makes this a much higher risk population, not only for um, intentional uh, overdose by suicide, but also unintentional overdose. Um, and 9% um, had that co-prescribing in internal medicine, um, while the use of opioids also in general remains high among these uh, populations. Um, not to say there aren't indicated reasons. I think, you know, what this all lends to is we want to make sure people are informed about the, the potential risks and the benefits and that we proceed mindfully and more mindfully than we have in how we approach um, prescribing these and how we approach also looking into alternative treatments. Um, so with that, um, you know, I will invite, we'll, we'll have some uh, discussion, um, have some time for discussion and then invite any of you that have the availability to stay on for a stakeholder meeting from one to two to really talk about um, how we foresee approaching um, a clinical and educational program for benzodiazepine um, prescribing and deprescribing, you know, emphasizing how do we safely and appropriately prescribe these and how do we safely and appropriately help individuals um, be deprescribed from these. Um, my hope is to pilot um, part of this within um, a subspecialty clinic I oversee um, within the university health system um, maybe in the next year. I hope to build off of um, work that's been done by uh, colleagues of mine at the Rocky Mountain VA, um, and we'll ask Jeff Gold to speak uh, about that. He's a, one of the pharmacists, along with Dr. Haug, that have overseen this. Um, we'll also call in Dr. Balik from the co, uh, Consortium for um, Drug Abuse to, to speak to how they might um, help us. Um, and the overall approach, I think, is for us to discuss what are what are ways to prevent um, the risks that come with long-term use of these um, medications and improve the safety of their use? What are ways to um, approach the deprescribing of these safely and appropriately? Um, and how can we come together with all of our um, knowledge and experience and create um, collaborations and um, track outcomes? Um, so at this point, I think we'd like to um, answer any questions um, that come up and I guess we'll let you know our panel see if they have or other people that have looked at these um, want to respond to them. Um, you know, I did want to, those that aren't looking in the chat call attention to, you know, someone asked if um, about the impact of benzodiazepine withdrawal on suicide. Um, and I know we've emphasized the importance of a safe, you know, appropriate deep prescribing um, because it can be a tenuous situation and have, as, as Dr. Huff um, shared, a lot of, you know, unexpected and pretty horrible um, side effects. Um, and uh, Dr. Huff, along with, um, I'm not going to do Dr. McCubrey, am I, I don't know if I'm butchering that. Um, it looks like did a survey um, in 2018 among 1,200 respondents um, about benzodiazepines um, and found that um, suicidal thoughts and actions were only slightly higher in the withdrawal condition compared to those that were also um, when they were taking benzodiazepines and not with, in withdrawal. Um, I think it's you know worth again pointing out that um, uh, it's, you know, there are a lot of confounding factors and I think all of this has to be approached um, carefully and in that in individuals that are already on these medications have a lot of other things that may increase their, their risks. Any, anything else that Dr. Huff or um, Barbara or Jill would like to, to add about benzo withdrawal and um, suicide? I hear someone, but I'm not sure who it is. Okay. I've been monitoring the chat function, and I might mention a couple of things sure. there. Um, one question had to do with whether decreases in opiate miso uh, prescriptions in the state coincided with cannabis legalization. Um, I I don't precisely know the answer to that. I um, I 
don't think they're they're they're, they're related. Um, my belief is that uh, if anything, they tend to uh, um, uh, increase each increases the use of the other, um, and uh, I think there are other factors at work. Is my impression it's about the time that. Um, uh, people were being pushed to use the prescription drug monitoring program. Uh, California, Pennsylvania. More frequently, it became easier to do that. Um, uh, so I, I think there were other other factors at work, but I'd be interested to hear what others uh, think about that. Michael, before somebody else um, answers that, um, can you? I just want to tell people to make sure that they're muted if they're not speaking because there's still somebody who's uh, talking on another conversation. <laughs> I, I can comment on, this is Steve Wright, I'm uh, comment on the cannabis issue. Data is all over the map uh, and you there really is nothing consistent in terms of uh, any kind of parallels necessarily between trajectories of opioid prescribing, use characteristics, benzo prescribing, and use characteristics to date. Uh, I think it really is going to take a little bit of caution in that regard too. Remember when uh, Marty Backuber actually identified that states with uh, uh, allowance for cannabis had lower overdose, uh, opioid associated overdoses. That reversed in uh, 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 Shover's uh, study indicated that the reverse is now uh, the case. And so you have to let the cannabis issue kind of settle in over a period of time before you can really adjudicate the relationship between those and other controlled substances. Yep. So this is, hey, this is, this is Rob Ballack, Alexis and Michael and Steve. I would, would echo that. The evidence is pretty clear that it's unclear about causality between um, relationship between benzodiazepine prescribing, opioid prescribing, and cannabis use, uh, whether that's just medical or recreational use in those policies. We have seen some, some decent evidence that certain things will change opioid prescribing, like mandatory education, prescribing limits, use of PDMPs. Some of those policy levers have been evaluated and the evidence is pretty good that they do change behavior in, in the intended direction. There's always, of course, unintended consequences too. Uh, with the policy levers, but but that's kind of what we do now. Uh, Paul Russ commented um, that we've neglected the uh, appropriate or, or legitimate um, uses of benzodiazepines. Um, uh, does anyone want to speak to that? Um, I I can certainly say that we um, we're not advocating. Um, the complete abandonment of them uh, as a class of drugs, uh, but we uh, do think there are uh, appropriate ways to use them, uh, generally more short-term use um, and longer acting uh, agents as opposed to uh, the, the shorter acting ones with more dependence liability um, as, as Christy experienced. Um, and in fact, her, her way out uh, involves switching from something uh, more short acting to something longer acting, uh, and then uh, gradually tapering off of that. So, uh, so we think there there are guidelines for appropriate use. Uh, I think one of the things that we'd like to do within our own data is to see um, how often uh, people are um, using benzodiazepines in a guideline concordant fashion. I could, I could speak to that. This is uh, Steve Wright. It's pretty clear that there is a very narrow list of uh, really good, good places to use benzodiazepines. First and foremost is alcohol withdrawal. Obviously, benzodiazepine withdrawal in the tapering fashion. Crisis anxiety, which does not involve psychotic uh, features, uh, as an amnestic agent uh, for uh, procedures. Uh, it has a significant role and a safe role. And then for uh, status epilepticus. Separate from that, um, use is pretty much uh, limited and it is not first line for other feature, uh, for other uh, conditions. And that includes a variety of anxiety conditions. 
uh, insomnia, and even, uh, even seizures. And when you look at those, validation for its efficacy is really only in the two to four week range. And when you look at that, uh, there was a study by Heather Ashton in 1987 taking a look at individuals who are on benzodiazepines for anxiety. Most of those individuals actually had more anxiety while taking benzodiazepines that got better when they were discontinued. And in fact, 20% of these individuals had the development of agoraphobia on benzodiazepines that improved subsequent to withdrawal. And, and that matches what Christy Huff's description is, where anxiety tends to worsen. That's part of the problem with prescribers is understanding that, my gosh, we have more anxiety, maybe I should increase the benzodiazepine when the obverse is the case. And we actually do think that there is an injury syndrome now associated with that. And just like opioid-induced hyperalgesia, discontinuation rather than acceleration of dose is the indicated first consideration. Thank you so much, Dr. Wright. Um, uh, someone also asked with regards to the, the data, um, says the NVDRS toxicology data nationally is mixed in suicide descendants, des decedents, I think maybe is what's meant. Is this an issue in Colorado data? So um, that's a good question. I uh, chatted to find out what met, mixed meant in this context, and it has to do with you know, what toxicology testing is done post-mortem. And so um, that's a good question. I don't have an answer for the Colorado results, but um, the next time we look at this, we'll include that information too. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and then someone else said, what about exploring patients that are left with long-term damage after taking benzodiazepines? Um, Dr. Huff, I don't know if that's something you might feel comfortable taking a uh, reply at. Oh, you're muted. Okay, sorry, technical <laughs> difficulties. Um, yeah, so that's a, an area that we need more research. I mean, I think it's pretty clear to me after what I've experienced. Um, yeah taking several years to taper and even a year after the fact, I still have symptoms related to a benzodiazepine. So there is some damage that occurs in a subset of individuals. And we really just need more research at this point to figure out first how to treat the damage. I mean, it, it does seem to improve over time. I know I've, I've had a lot of improvements over the past year. Um, and then also research to figure out who's going to be at risk. Maybe there are certain people that just should never take a benzodiazepine because they're more at risk. We just don't have any research for that at the, at the present. This is, this is a really important issue because a lot of individuals with these very peculiar symptoms that could involve hypersensitivity to sound, taste, smell, touch, uh, as well as rapid fluctuations of symptoms getting worse and getting better seem so peculiar that they get relegated and considered to have somatic symptom disorder, which is a way of kind of saying uh, uh, self-culpable uh, issues are applied to the patients themselves when in fact these are real. We don't have a lot of data in relation to that. We do think that there's a set of uh, receptors, the peripheral benzodiazepine receptors that might be explanatory, as well as uh, Stephen LaCourt's hypothesis that it has to do with oxidative stress. But it's really important to identify, you know, kind of a, a, a physiologic pathway here to, de uh, to really validate these particular concerns. I am aware of individuals that have uh, persistent symptoms 10 years beyond di full discontinuation. And so I'm pretty convinced there is an injury pattern, not simply withdrawal. When we use the term withdrawal, it tends to imply is it going to go away, when in fact injury might be more appropriate for a subset of these individuals. 
Well, I think we've gotten to the uh, top of the hour and I'm uh, going to say thanks again to everyone who's participated um, up to this point um, and um, let people go who need to go on to uh, other, other things. Um, everyone is welcome to stay. We're gonna continue recording uh, the next portion of the program. Uh, and um, so at, at this point, um, I'll turn it over to uh, um, Alexis to, uh, to kick off the uh, stakeholder meeting uh, with my thanks to everyone for their participation uh, in the first hour. Thank you, Michael. Um, so let me go, obviously, um, you know, even if you can join, you need to take, if you need to take a break, uh, please, please do so. I know it can be hard to sit this long in front of screens as we are forced to do these days. Um, but in the interest of time, I will go ahead and get started. Um, let me share my screen. Give me one second here. Okay. Oops. Okay, hopefully you all can now see my screen. If you can't, um, someone flag me down or send me a chat. Um, so I kind of already um, alluded to this. I also um, have asked Dr. Valak um, to speak about our possible collaboration with the consortium and um, have other input. It sounds like we have, um, as we hoped, a lot of participation and interest in this issue. Um, and just want to discuss how to kind of keep this this ball rolling um, in a thoughtful um, thoughtful and appropriate manner. So thank you all for who are able to stick around. Um, so um, the first thing I wanted to do is um, one of my colleagues um, and teachers, uh, uh, Jeff Gold, along with James Haug, who's actually also addiction psychiatry. Um, they um, have implemented at the Rocky Mountain VA a process for um, supporting uh, safe and appropriate benzodiazepine prescribing, um, as well as implementing a deprescribing program. So I thought it might be useful to just start with hearing from um, someone that has um, been approaching this about you know, how it started, um, what they've seen as far as education with prescribers and patients, and then also the experience of deprescribing, just to give us an idea. Um, and then I'll also ask um, Dr. Huff um, to speak a little more to her experience of going through um, uh, deprescribing um, and some of the lessons. So um, Jeff Gold, are you, you on here? I think you might be here via phone. Can you hear me okay? Oh, yep, there you are. Great. Yes, hello. My name is uh, Jeff Gold. I'm a clinical pharmacy specialist at the Rocky Mountain Regional Medical Center. And alongside uh, Dr. James Haug, uh, several years ago, came up, we came up with the idea of starting a benzodiazepine tapering clinic, with which Dr. Haug um, renamed the Comprehensive Stress Management Clinic, which I think to kind of show a more holistic approach to uh, helping people get off of medications and explore other evidence-based treatments for anxiety, for PTSD, for depression, for insomnia. And I, I quite like the name comprehensive stress management since it just kind of created in uh, the veterans' minds, the patients' minds, that there was more than one way of thinking about their treatment than just coming off of these medicines, coming off of the benzodiazepines. Essentially, the, the clinic has shifted a lot over the years, and I can, and certainly Dr. Haug can comment about how it's changed. But initially, uh, Dr. Haug did a group uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for coming on, uh, for anxiety while people came off these medicines. But we took patients, veterans from referrals through other mental health providers and through primary care providers. And essentially we would meet with the veterans once every week, once every two weeks, depending on the nature of their, their needs. Um, and then we would slowly uh, decrease the dose of their medicine. And at some of the things I think that are, were particularly helpful and useful in this, first and foremost is that getting a urine drug screen on everybody and doing the PDMP, the card or prescription drug monitoring program on every patient was just critical and essential. And this was, it came to the point where, I mean, this is just required for everybody who's tapering these medicines. Even for the folks who are highly motivated, 
who are lower risk that we just felt that it was rather than it being about like uh, patient specific factors that it was just done for everyone always as a part of being on these medicines. And in fact, even the, the VA, Dr. Lisa Smith, who's the outpatient medical director and, um, and Dr. McPhee, uh, there's been a movement towards anybody who is prescribed a controlled substance gets a um, uh, gets urine drug screens and gets uh, Colorado prescription drug monitoring program checks like at least once every six months, if you know, at the minimum, you know, yearly. And this has just become like a standard of practice. Uh, part of it is just ensuring safety, just making sure that these, that the patients are using these medications as intended and that the goal of being on such medications is an improvement in their overall functioning. And that certainly if their urine, they're testing positive on a urine drug screen for another substance or they're filling prescriptions through another provider, it's, you could make the argument this is not an improvement in overall function and therefore the, the treatment is compromised with respect to the patient's safety. So I think doing that for everyone for always and building that into the policy has actually been really helpful. And I think uh, not just for patients seen in mental health, but for primary care as well. Like this is the, something that should just be done routinely for everyone. The, the second part um, is that Dr. Haug uh, utilized and I utilize as well a, um, a withdrawal symptom checklist specific to benzodiazepines to assess withdrawal symptoms throughout the taper process. This is a very, very important. And also we would keep track of the scores. And uh, that was quite useful. And, and finally, I know that uh, we're quite limited on time is that we've uh, followed periodically, and I know Dr. Howe keeps a record, and we've actually published some data on this through a, a residency project um, to look at, did these patients actually remain off of benzodiazepines after completing the clinic? Were, were we successful in keeping them, getting them off of benzodiazepines, and did they remain off of benzodiazepines? And so tracking outcomes in the system, because certainly the best way of tapering, the, the best method for tapering benzodiazepines is to never start them. And uh, so, of course, like making sure that you have a really good front end education provided to primary care providers and other mental health staff about, you know, using other options instead of a benzodiazepine, particularly for long term treatments, that this is just not advisable. Um, and in fact, they've even shown that the Empower study, which was done through the VA, looked at direct to consumer advertising as a way to get people motivated to get off these medicines or for some folks to never start them. So. I think, I think that's the other piece that's really important is that there's consistent education to providers about not starting these medicines. It's so much more difficult to get somebody off of a, Medica a high dose alprazolam that they've been on for 15 years versus somebody versus like not starting the medication to begin with. Thank you, Jeff. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties trying to unmute myself and uh and also share my screen. Um, I guess, I, can you also just comment on what the VA's approach to safe prescribing is or prescribing guidelines? Yeah. Um, you have I, an informed I, consent, I, right? What's that? There's an informed consent. Yeah, we have it for, we have a, um, we encourage the use and I, uh, of it. There's a benzodiazepine uh, treatment contract that if you are going to be on these medicines like these are the rules and like this is dr smith and uh, dr wangi i'm not uh, naren like we're involved in this many years ago we came up with treatment contracts with patients that if they were going to be on these medications that they would have to sign like a benzodiazepine treatment agreement and if they ever violated the terms of the agreement then of course like that this this is a reason to reevaluate the safety of the medication. And it was really specific around urine drug screening, around the PDMP, that if they ever, or any other aberrant behaviors were identified, like if a patient was intimidating to a provider or recurrent no-shows, like then these were grounds to like question that is this medication improving your overall function? Um, and so it looked at really like very specific things that if they were, they were like true or not true, then the, the patient was aware that this means that the medication would be reevaluated, that it wasn't just is your subjective sense of your anxiety better, or, um, but are you able to fulfill these duties? Are you able to do these things as a part of getting this medication? Awesome. Thank you. And I know. 
clear, I think, to like, yeah. and, and really helpful to come to sit down with somebody and like, we're um, in order to be prescribed this medication, these are the things that like have to happen. If they don't happen, we're going to have to reevaluate whether or not this medication should be prescribed. And that's if people are going to be maintained on them in a tapering clinic, then it's, you're coming in with the goal where you're setting the expectation from the beginning that, you know, our, we want to get you off this medicine and here's why. And what about co-prescribing at the VA? Um, what's the approach for like opioids and benzodiazepines? You know, in, in general, the VA, the, I'm speaking for the VA at large, but the VA has really made, um, the VA has really made it, uh, one of their goals to not co-prescribe opioids and benzodiazepines. And, and sometimes I think that the, the VA can be a little absolutist about these things. And, mm -hmm. and we have to be careful to be reasonable and y'all are clinicians. And like, there are times when you're going to make decisions that are on, on that are different from like the very specific way that we're kind of told to do things. And I think that there should be room for that, of course. But the VA has, uh, in general, made it to not co-prescribe opioids and benzodiazepines together whenever possible, such that they've created dashboards where we can actually get provider report cards, and it'll show you that you have X number of patients that are prescribed a benzodiazepine and an opioid. X number of patients that are prescribed a benzodiazepine that are over 65. X number of patients that are prescribed more than one benzodiazepine. Or you can even break it down by amount of medication that they're prescribed. So you could get a lit, you could show up on a report card that you have X number of patients who are prescribed more than 150 milligrams of morphine equivalents. And so it kind of gives providers a sense of where do you fall in the pack? And I think that can be quite useful too. I mean, in terms of just to see where to kind of get a sense of how are you practicing for, you know, um, and how are your how are your colleagues practicing? And there are many reasons that it can account for like the differences from inheriting a provider panel that was really heavy, like that used a lot of benzodiazepines versus somebody else. But I think that those things are really helpful. But the VA has made a point to really minimize use of benzodiazepines in any way. Yeah. yeah, I know for just to give an example, I mean, just having that informed consent, I mean, I had a patient that part of the process was just telling him, you know, I see you're on both. And whenever, even though I'm not prescribing the opioid, if I'm going to take over the benzodiazepine and we're going to try to work on other treatment treatments, um, the first thing is I, I'm going to give you a script for Narcan. Um, and that, I guess, hit home with him and his wife because he's like, oh, I, I didn't even realize that that was an, a, a risk or that this was a thing. I don't, and not to say he wasn't told it before, but he certainly it had he didn't remember. So I don't know if Dr. Haug is on here, and um, but I wanted if he is um, to give him a chance to add anything before I move on to a few other folks and then open it up. I, thanks, Alexis. No, I think Jeff did a great job uh, describing what we did. I, I will say the clinic did shift over time. Initially, we had more patients that were. Um, you know, interested in stopping their benzodiazepine, but having a hard time with us, having a hard time with it that came and, and they were more amenable to doing a CBT group as things have, uh, you know, moved along over a few years, you know, fewer of the patients are interested specifically in coming off and, and it tends to be not exactly adversarial, but, but the patients are not always the ones that are excited about coming off of the benzodiazepine. And so we don't have the CBT group mostly because patients are not interested in in participating in that way, but. Uh... Thank you. Yeah, I may ask, I mean, Dr. Huff and some of the other um, kind of uh, benzo um, information advocates to, to talk about. I think that's something we commonly encounter in outpatient psychiatry. You know, we may feel strongly that we think that the medication is no longer improving the functioning or maybe causing more problems and that it's really challenging for some patients to, you know, even though they might admit some of it may not be helping to, you know, how do you approach when they don't necessarily want or see potential benefit in trying to taper, not even necessarily fully get off, but um, taper. So um, one of many challenges that we won't, won't solve in one hour, but um, well, thank you, Jeff. And I wanted to give um, Dr. Huff a chance just to, since 
to speak a little more about her experience with how her taper was approached, because um, I do think it will give us some ideas of um, what to do and what not to do. Um, so Dr. Huff, I've um, teed up, I think the slides that, the, some of the other slides you'd prepared here. Are you able to see those? Yeah, that one, you can skip this one. That's a repeat. Okay. I think uh, if we get to the next one, yeah, we'll start here. Okay. So um, my prescribers, you know, initially that I went to weren't very knowledgeable and I ended up figuring out what was going out with going on with me via a Google search. Um, I typed Ga Xanax into the search bar and came up with this website, Benzo Buddies. And I just mentioned this here because this is a huge website, over 70,000 members, and it's an internet forum for those withdrawing from benzodiazepines. And many are doing this without their doctor's guidance or support. And um, a lot of this is because we just don't have resources and infrastructure in place. We don't have a, a deep prescribing clinic built like we all are discussing right now. Um, so what you have is people teaching other people the specifics of how to taper off a benzodiazepine, um, which, you know, obviously, obviously that comes with all sorts of issues. Um, and so I read a lot of information on this website that I had never even heard of in medical school. Of course, I went through an internal medicine residency, so my background would have been in primary care. Uh, but I was shocked to find out how severe and lengthy um, this benzo withdrawal process could be. Um, I learned about the Ashton Manual, which was basically the original deprescribing clinic back in the UK in the 80s and 90s, um, and have protocols for how to taper off benzodiazepines. And I learned the specifics of how to taper from other um, forum members. Next. Um, and in my search for getting, trying to get help, I came across some common pitfalls. And this is also what I see in my advocacy work as well. Um, you know, adverse effects from benzodiazepines are often misdiagnosed as either a medical illness or a mental illness. Like, when I came back with the raging anxiety from the Xanax interdose withdrawal, I was told, and I told her, I, I need to get off the Xanax, this is the problem. I was told, well, you, you're not gonna get off the Xanax because you have too much anxiety. So, you know, we, we just need better education about these issues, obviously. And, you know, obviously misdiagnosis leads to unnecessary testing and um, polypharmacy. Um, one other, um, pitfall that comes into play is um, physicians are uh, not always recognizing that um, adverse reactions and side effects can happen at what is considered low or therapeutic doses, which it isn't the case. Um, and then, a, you know, another issue is I, I was told that I couldn't be dependent on Xanax because I've just been taking it a few weeks, but I now know that dependence can develop in as little as a week. And then I think the, the fallacy of equating addiction with physical dependence is, is a problem as well, because, you know, somebody with just straight phys phys physical dependence is not going to necessarily a 12-step program. You know, I, I saw a psychiatrist who said the way to get off Xanax was give the pill bottle to my husband to control my use. And it's like, well, that's not going to, that, that's not a taper plan. That's not going to help me get off the drug. So, you know, I... Obviously, that wasn't helpful. Okay, next slide. Did they, they might have ended. Did they end up out of order, or did one of them get? I don't know. Oh, so Do you, is this what? Sorry, is that good? <laughs> um, go back one, I think. Yeah. So I ended up transitioning to Valium. Um, because the long half-life helped facilitate tapering and that, that solved my interdose withdrawal problem. Now, of course, the taper was still a, a very miserable process and I was really sick the entire time. Um, and I ended up stabilizing on 15 milligrams of Valium. And then, you know, I tried to follow the Ashton protocol that I showed you earlier. And I will say that it's meant to be a guide because I made the reduction based on her protocol and it was just too fast. So I had to go a lot slower. Um, next. And I ended up ultimately using a technique called micro taper, which I learned from the people on the benzodiazepine forums. And um, it's basically microductions in dose using either a high precision scale or 
a liquid formulation and I would take a, a pill and I would use a nail file and, you know, get till I got the appropriate dose just so I can make these tiny reductions. And that made my symptoms, although things were still horrible, it made it made it much more tolerable. Um, and this, this is a picture of me during the taper. You can just see I didn't, I was pretty miserable, pretty sick, um, entirely disabled, honestly, experienced 80 different symptoms that I documented. So this was a, a, a lengthy and horrible process. Uh, next. And um, yeah, you can, I talked about that so we can, next. And just, I guess one thing I wanna leave you with is and Steve Wright mentioned this earlier, it's clear this is not just physical dependence because this goes on for a long time. A subset of patients are experiencing very severe and protracted withdrawals, sometimes lasting years from these drugs. And I think that these drugs are altering the nervous system at a molecular level, sometimes permanently. And obviously we don't have the research as I mentioned earlier, we, we need to get that information. Uh, but many patients, for lack of a better term at the moment, are describing it as a brain injury, uh, which I, I think is pretty fair. Um, and as I said, just more research is needed on this. I think that's probably the, yeah. Dr. Huff or Dr. Wright or anyone else, I mean, have have you come across any other resources to talk about? I mean, I, I know I'm struck, I know Dr. Allen and I talk about this, but I mean, there are some patients that seem to do okay on these medications. Certainly many, especially with shorter acting, develop tolerance over time and require higher doses. And then there's other patients that are exquisitely sensitive. I mean, as you describe, I mean, and to the point where many of them do get labeled as, oh, you're, you know, you also have a somatic symptom disorder. I just didn't know if you, if anything has been shown. I mean, one thought I had was, of course, some people might be rapid metabolizers. Um, yeah, I just, I just don't think we know at this point. I mean, I kind of liken it to a game of Russian roulette. You just don't know who's gonna suffer suffer these severe effects. So mm -hmm. it is one of the reasons we need to be extremely cautious about prescribing them in the first place. I would echo what uh, Christy is saying. We simply do not know at this particular time. It's interesting because there are really parallels in the pain sensitivity issue universe. Uh, <clears throat> um, Mohammed Yunus identified 15 different uh, pain conditions that are hypersensitivity states that includes fibromyalgia, but also mastodynia, vulvodynia, uh, chronic daily headache, things like that. And that has transpired then to Marty Paul, who has taken a look at some of the background genetics as well as the oxidative stress and has identified genetic uh, variations that really describe individuals with hypersensitivity uh, that have the potential for developing hypertensi uh, hypersensitivity states. My thesis is that I think that that's going to be the case here as well. Uh, uh, genetically identified individuals will have uh, increased uh, hypersensitivity, but we're far away from that. Those studies are not ongoing. And so in the meantime, limiting initiation, limiting duration, and a very thoughtful, very slow tapering process, I think is the way to go. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Can I chime in here for just a second? Yeah, please do. I can't see. Hi, I will... Jane McCubrey. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm a social scientist, so I don't do anything without serious literature reviews. And the reviews that I have done suggest that there's a small percentage of people who experience virtually no withdrawal symptoms, maybe 17 to 20 percent. Um, and and certainly, I think the idea there might be a genetic problem with respect to sensitivity rings true for me personally. I am so sensitive to chemicals in wine or coffee or anything else that I have virtually had to cut all of that out of my life for most of my life. And, and then there's the benzoin. So I think there's some evidence that some people can tolerate these things, but they're not the majority. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd be yeah. happy to point you to the articles I'm thinking about when I say that. It's not an opinion of mine. It's yeah, an yeah. observation of the literature. 
Well, I will also invite those of you, um, you know, that want to continue kind of our forward work and it'll be next step. Um, and those of you that have done a lot of this literature or personal experience um, to, to be part of our ongoing um, effort to approach this. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to add here and then actually wanted to ask um, Dr. Valak to speak to is, um, and this got brought up some during the, the lecture was, you know, what can we learn from the opioid epidemic, but not only the opioid epidemic that resulted from um, addressing pain over prescribing opioids, thinking that they were um, not as risky or harmful as we thought. Um, and also, uh, you know, the, the adverse effects that came from the resulting pendulum um, of certain uh, coming up with these, um, these prescribing guidelines for opioids, like from the CDC, which have a, an important place, um, but also people can take very, you know, you saw people that had been maintained on high dose long term opioids suddenly just be told from their doctors that were prescribing them, sorry, I have to take you off, um, or I have to immediately get you down to the recommended dosage, um, and people to be cut off and have really adverse events. So I don't know, Dr. Valak, if you mind chiming in here both what you think are positive lessons learned from how um, the approach to the opioid epidemic and also things we might need to you know, stay aware of as far as potential adverse outcomes or consequences. Sure, thanks, thanks Alexis. Thanks everybody. Um, great to see so many of you uh, again on this one. And it's kind of like deja vu all over again, right? I mean, we've sort of been here with, with, with when I came up anyway, it was, Percodan, Percocet, Oxy, but it was also in parallel with, with you know, we had Dalmain and we had, we had Benzo sleepers and we had, you know, Dalmain and Restoril and things that we saw problems even then uh, about use and probably, you know, more widespread use than was warranted uh, and longer use than was warranted. So there's a lot of parallels and we learned, we've learned a lot in this opioid crisis. We're still, you know, we're still a few years out from we think seeing the effects we're going to want to see on the, the downstream outcomes and but uh, there's a latency period obviously between people starting an opioid or starting on a benzodiazepine and when they have occurrence of something that's that's untoward and then when we when the resolution of that good or bad that that can often be something that is not a few weeks uh, as uh, Dr. Huff has noted this is not uncommon in either of these that this is years and years that, that this takes and the and the period is very long. And we've spent a lot of work, you know, we've spent a lot of time, I've spent probably the last decade along with many people on this call, like Barb Gabella and, and Steve Wright and Josh Bloom, and I saw a bunch of names, Angela Von a um, bunch of people involved in this opioid work over the last decade. And we've, we've learned an awful lot about that and, and have found that the, the short answer is it's really complicated to change behavior on a large scale. And to do that, you need some sort of ongoing coordinated effort that really is maximizing leverage on a bunch of different things. And the approach we took that I think has been relatively successful has been to try to um, create a, a minimal but uh, adequate amount of ongoing infrastructure support like we've done with the consortium to keep efforts moving because the, the fear is that you have a wonderful event like this and I do not discount this in any way. This is awesome. The turnout is great. I love it. This is what we need is really getting people together and jazzed up and fired up about this because it's important. It's really important and we should be getting fired up about it, right? But how do you sustain this and convert this into impact in terms of public awareness, what providers are doing, what patients are doing, how systems are built, how policy is made, how policy is implemented, how do we keep, keep stakeholders engaged, how do we measure what we're doing in terms of both the size and scope of the problem the way it is now, but how the progress we might be making and, and measuring for uh, you know, unintended effects to, to our, our, our interventions to it, and how do we try to move the needle on these things? And I think you know, we've learned, and at least in my opinion, we have a chassis that, that may well extend because we, we view this as prescription drug misuse prevention, which is you know, all things that are controlled substances. We've been, we've been dealing with opioids for the last several years, but really it does apply to benzos and stimulants as well. Talk to people about, about, about amphetamines and Adderall and talk about stimulant use 
you'll see an awful lot of a lot of parallelism in all three of these classes of drugs. And so we're, we're, we have the very similar approach like VA. If it's a controlled substance, it's kind of how we view it. And these, we think some of these things can be helpful to, to educate providers is a massive lift. We, we finally passed legislation here in the state where there's requiring doctors to have education about opioids. First time we've had any mand mandatory legislation in this state since 1980 in that regard. It's a huge lift. You have no idea until you've tried to do it. Um, to get something that sounds simple or a mandatory PDMP checking. Well, that sounds simple. Uh, trust me, it is not um, any of these things. But I think these different levers, like what, what Jill Ryan presented as policy levers, are all very reasonable things, many of which we've been working on. And I think we can take a lot of the lessons learned to try to change behavior, which is what we want to do, for the better. Um, and it's not, again, not to restrict people from ever having opioids. So we take balanced policy approach, try to reduce overprescribing, reduce unintended consequences, but preserve access for legitimate medical need. And that's really the, the you know, that's, that is the, the $64,000 question is, who are those people that have legitimate need? How do we avoid those that are going to have problems if we can identify them and try to steer away from that? Um, so many of the concepts, I think, are very much similar. Uh, and we're starting to try to try to figure some of those things out, but it's a it's a long process to do it. And, you know, I think we could very well take something like we've been doing with this and maybe have a, uh, apply some of those same kinds of techniques and lessons learned and policy levers and, and try to apply them to this uh, and, and hopefully have similar results. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I do wanna add, I can't, while sharing my screen, if I try to look at the chat, it takes away the screen share. So. Um, if anyone else sees um, chat stuff from um, anyone from, you know, uh, Rob or Christy that you want to pause me and um, and bring in because you think it's appropriate now, uh, you know, I don't mind being interrupted. I think at this point, a lot of this is re re summarizing stuff we've already said. So, you know, how do we think of this from an education standpoint? Um, you know, how do, how do we more appropriately educate folks about the alternative treatments for anxiety and insomnia um, or augmentations? Again, I, I'm, you know, I want to be, Larry, I, I think there is a, there is a time and a place for some individuals to be prescribed a benzodiazepine. Um, and I think, um, you know, making sure it's safe and appropriate prescribing and then it's not just done because it's the, the fastest thing to prescribe and the fastest thing to provide a sense of relief, although ultimately that can become a very uh, slippery slope. Um, and who are tar target audiences? And I think as Rob alluded to, it's on multiple levels. I mean, this is for prescribers, I think for mental health providers as a whole um, and needing to, to strengthen that connection for patients and their families, um, making sure they understand and then the, the public um, at, at large. Um, and as far as safe prescribing um, uh, guidelines, I mean, things I thought, you know, we may want to include are things like recommendations on um, or just education about, you know, the formulations, the dosage and the durations, as well as the follow up frequency. I know I'm always kind of and then I know part of it's a comment on the limits in our system, but, you know, when someone gets a, a you know, high dose, um, 30 day, you know, scheduled benzodiazepine with six refills, um, I become concerned that there's not an ongoing uh, attempt to address what, what the benzodiazepine was prescribed for um, and what else needs to be addressed and how else to engage them in, in treatment. Um, people already mentioned the prescription drug monitor checks, um, minimizing high risk combinations um, decreasing our risk of intentional and unintentional overdoses. And then I think informed consent in a very concerted fashion um, is, is important. And that might include, you know, what else do we require? Like making, I think making mandatory urine drug screens just part of the expectation so that people don't feel like they're trying to be caught or found out, but start just come to understand it's part of how we can safely prescribe these medications that come with risks. So does anyone see um, any parts of the chat they want to 
to bring up or does any if anyone wonder, wants to unmute themselves uh, alexis i wonder if i could uh, jump in and uh, yeah, amplify please do. what rob uh, said i of course i agree with rob on everything uh, right rob <laughs> uh anyway i see that the uh proposed uh, center for you know benzodiazepine withdrawal if that's the term that's going to be used here uh can uh do two different things um and i in, in one of the lessons learned i think from the opioid crisis experience is a model that's developed uh, in new hampshire i believe a hub and spoke model where we have a true center of excellence for the most sophisticated and the most challenging of benzodiazepine withdrawal uh, circumstances and uh, complications in, in that regard. And then a concentric circle around those of uh, trained individuals. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Christy. Uh, a, a concentric circle of those around that particular center of excellence or hub, so to speak, of individuals that are able to do uh, standard, typical benzodiazepine uh, discontinuation process as well. And then a third concentric circle around that of educated primary care and psychiatry who are limiting use uh, and limiting uh, duration of, uh, of use. This center of excellence then becomes the, the center from which training occurs. Uh, first and foremost for the concentric circle immediately surrounding them of uh, individuals that are somewhat uh, skilled with regards to discontinuation. Uh, but it's also the center of excellence with regards to various uh, processes that uh, really do require a lot more skills. One, one actually that comes up is the issue of using flumazenil, which is uh, has been touted as a benzodiazepine or GABA-A receptor antagonist is probably better characterized as a uh, GABA-A very weak partial agonist as it seems to reboot the receptor at the right or, or close to the right uh, amount in terms of that. So in their variety of other agents uh, and, uh, and very sophisticated processes. Another uh, website that I would direct people to is a group called intercompass.com, which has very sophisticated benzodiazepine tapering strategies. And that brings me then to the really importance of having uh, a, a, a group of uh, survivors, uh, not only for supportive purposes, but also uh, to bounce uh, you know, solutions off of. I have found it wasn't in the medical universe the best solutions for assisting patients, but through individuals on the online sites and through conversations and emails with them. So it really is true that the better outcomes are going to be uh, patient directed uh, with sufficient support. And we do see in the addiction universe now, peer coaching and trained peer coaches as being part of that process. And I can see this center of excellence in that regard. Um, anyway, uh, those are just some of my thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I actually I think on some ver previous version of the slide and my attempt to and then simplify things, I had um, kind of thought about uh, where a hub and spoke might fit in because certainly I think the not the point is not that everyone needs to be um, referred to a specialty um, clinic, but rather that we need to just improve education and figure out for people that are on the more complicated, complex, and high uh, symptom, um, oh my gosh, uh, component, you know, how do we um, further support them? So that's a very, very well put, doctor, right? Um, I think the other thing, you know, I think what we've seen in psychiatry that I'd like to move away from is people being, you know, how do we try to make this a little more um, also patient led as far as in engagement and not just be sent patients once they're told, well, I'm not going to prescribe this anymore, or you need to get off of this. Um, but how do we through education collaboration, I think, um, utilizing um, individuals uh, that have gone through this, how do we get patients um, in agreement with the consideration of whether, you know, of stopping or, or at least decreasing um, benzodiazepine use or figuring out, you know, if it's, ongoing use is appropriate because I think I, 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 the residents that I supervise often feel like they really 
engage in a power struggle um, when referred people that are on high doses have been for a long time and they um, approach them suggesting that we need to try something different. So I don't know if anyone else has thoughts about that. Dr. Ripple, this is uh, Jeff Gold again. I, you know, yeah. I was talking to Dr. Haug about this and you know, tapered a, a large number of veterans off of benzodiazepines and had a number of very complicated tapers where the first appointment starts with them not sitting down in the chair and like using curse words and thinking about like anecdotally, like what is it that kind of sets people up for success throughout the taper? And there's something about how you present the idea of like why we're doing this and being curious about other options and evidence-based treatments and kind of giving them a way to think about benzodiazepines that's maybe different from what they've heard before. I mean, sometimes they've been comparing it to like cigarettes, that there was a time in the history of this country when physicians like recommended that people smoke, but we, and this, and then later on, we now know about all the of smoking and that we're learning that benzodiazepines have many risks. And I, and uh, just being curious with them about like, I wonder how you could feel and how this could look pretty, you know, basic motivational interviewing type work. But I'd be curious to see more research and data about how people are managing these conversations and like how the, how they kind of start off like talking to folks about it. Um, I often find that just again, anecdotally, that if that initial conversation is one where they kind of feel heard and they kind of come to understand like why we're doing this and why we think it's a good idea that it just seems to set up the whole taper process for success. And Alexis, can I interject? This is Dee Foster. Yeah, please do. Thank you. Um, I host a podcast on benzodiazepines. Um, I've been doing that for a year and a half now. Rob, I, I work with you a couple of times. And Steve, I work with um, Dr. Wright and Christy. Um, and that question is, and this is, <laughs> this is one of those things. I, I want to mention something real quick, and that is right now, my voice is cracking, my arms are shaking, and I used to speak in front of thousands of people at a time. And this is me five and a half years, ben benzo-free, okay? Um, I'm fine when the anxiety doesn't come up, but when I get anxious, um, my GABA receptors no longer are functioning very well and I have trouble managing things. So I'm gonna calm myself down here <laughs> real quick. But I just wanted to show you an, an, an example of this, um, I host a podcast, I can do that because I'm not live and I can calmly talk with people. But once I go live, my symptoms kick up again. You had mentioned, Jeff, about the, um, about the initial conversation. And I work with people daily, as Christy does too, um, who are dealing with this and going through it. And so many of them find out about this by doing an internet search. They don't know what their symptoms are. They don't know what, what caused them. And they, they get into the panic attack phase. And that's when they usually come to us. They come to BIC, they come to Benzo Free, the organization I have, they come to the Ashton Manual. And so many of them have, are already in that panic state. And now we're having to try to bring them back a little bit and get them and help them understand that you can withdraw through a slow taper and manage this. But that's because most of them haven't had much success with their physicians. And it's usually their general practitioners who have prescribed them. And it's just trying to get that information. This is where we want to make sure everybody knows that we're happy to help. We're the ones that have been working with these people for a long time. And anything you need from us, please let us know. But as you had mentioned, Dr. Ridfo, that um, there's a lot of education out there from people like Christy and like Steve and other ones who have been doing this for a while. And we're happy to help as far as the psychological side of this battle. Thank you. Thank you so much um, that you're your contribution is invaluable and, and, you know, even walking us through your, your current lived experience. Um, I do think that that is a huge piece that has been really been missing from engaging patients in this conversation um, and providers. I think, you know, to be reminded from um, by people that we meet and hold um, in high regard that have experienced this, I think really helps bring it home that it's, not just all in your head or, you know, that, that individuals aren't just trying to be um, difficult patients or want to, you know, stay on or not change. Um, that, um, I mean, I, I can think back to a patient I had with a resident that in just reassuring them, like we need to just let the patient show us when and how they're ready to make changes to this. This is not them being, 
you know, defiant or resistant. Um, and to actually, the resident was able to see the patient through the full taper, which was actually still probably faster than it might have needed to be, but the patient was very um, motivated. Um, the resident has told me it was one of, one of the most rewarding experiences he had um, because the patient came back so grateful um, that they'd experienced it. And had we just stopped with the second interaction where the patient had put things on hold um, uh, and um, seen that as somehow defiance, um, I think we you know, wouldn't have gotten to the other end. So um, I don't have, I'm hoping to get out of my slides here in a second. The last thing I wanted to just ask is, um, Dr. Valak had um, mentioned, you know, that we could use the uh, the structure and um, that he's built through the consortium um, and, and kind of as it expands to include other um, controlled substances. Um, so I was wondering, you might just say a little bit about, you know, how how we might create a working group within the consortium um, of those people that are interested in, in continuing this conversation and, and mindfully proceeding with a, a different approach. Sure, thanks Alexis. And it's, there's certainly more than one way to skin a cat and we're not uh, advocating for more work than we already have signed up for. But that said, we are very willing, I've already vetted this internally, that we're very willing because of our focus not being, we came in the door not being opioids only, though that's a lot of what we do, uh, and trying to focus on these kinds of issues. And we think we're positioned to be a potential way to move things forward from the standpoint that we do have a lot of infrastructure built um, that is stuff that was, it's going to have to be done no matter which way you go, one way or another, you're going to have to have ongoing infrastructure, be able to meet, be able to convene people. We've got established work groups for things like public awareness that have developed, implemented, secured funding for, um, promoted, and then evaluated public awareness campaigns for opioids and stigma and all kinds of things for, for similar topics, you know, different drug class, but a lot of similarities provider education work group, PDMP work group that deals just with the data that Barbara presented from, that we obtained statutory authority, you know, rolled the laws up the hill to get access for CDPHE to have access for the data that Barbara was using to do that analysis. And that required a lot of work because those data are not freely available for analysis. Um, the state mm -hmm. is very protective of those data. And we had to assure people in the legislature that it was okay that we're using them for analysis and surveillance that it would be for public health gain. Um, so to do that, and then to work with the provider community, uh, lots of me medical subspecialty associations of all kinds, all specialties really virtually around the state. Um, guideline development, we've done some guideline development about opioid reduction, alternatives to opioids, harm reduction, and referral to treatment, the kind of principles for the opioid crisis to get virtually every subspecialty organization in Colorado writing subspecialty specific guidelines, and it's called Colorado's Cure. Um, to write multiple sets of these guidelines that have the same principles behind them, that we don't want to use opioids except when we need to use them fewer, use other things instead, harm reduce and refer people to treatment when you need it. And it could be different principles here, but some of those may be the same. And the process we use to get everybody together to talk about what does it look like in primary care or in the hospital or in the emergency room or whatever, to do similar things, we're pretty well engaged with that community then the treatment community we're pretty uh, engaged with um, around the state, Legis the legislature, the attorney general, those task forces, the foundation community, um, you know, all the folks that you really kind of need to engage with, um, people with lived experience of all kinds, patients themselves, family members, um, people who are doing, want to become involved in different ways, whether that's advocacy or policy or um, you know, sharing their lived experience. We have an affected family members and friends. One of our work groups is specifically for that. So we might be able to start with, you know, a group that is focused on this. And then it may well be that over time, this thing gets big enough that there's people from the other work groups, like if we want to do something provider education related, we jointly work with that group to design and implement provider education programming that could then be scaled. And we try to reach, be able to scale something that's going to affect the whole state is our focus. You know, we want to work with big systems, yes, but we want to create methods and approaches. Uh, Steve Wright and Josh Bloom, who are probably still on the call, can tell you, we have driven and talked to two doctors at a time in Alamosa or La Junta, 
or 3,000 doctors at a time at a giant event, you know, wherever it is, you know, and we will do whatever we need to do to get education done across the state and, and seek out funding for those kinds of things. And I just think there's a lot that could be done and we might be able to adapt that and say, we just start with a group. These groups are co-chaired by people who are really highly motivated, like, you know, like maybe a Dr. Ritfo and Dr. Wright, or a, I don't know, I'm just throwing out names. I don't know, I'm not yeah. saying who would do it, but you know, whoever's got motivation to do this. And then we rotate those co-chair, those co-chairmanships over time so that everybody who's really interested gets a chance uh, to really be involved. And then, then these work groups, we've got some infrastructure for just keeping things together, keeping it going, elevating this at the policy level, elevating it with the associations and be that specialty societies or general medicine societies. Um, so it's, it's, I think, an attractive way that we have always viewed this as more than opioids. And we, we would be happy to do that if there was, if there was interest in doing that. Well, I mean, I won't speak for everyone else, but I know on my on my part, I am definitely interested and want to utilize, um, you know, all the resources and knowledge and experience that we have on hand. Um, I think, you know, I, the last thing we want is to feel like we're in a vacuum um, and only hearing ourselves talk. Um, and I think this is a, a wonderful start to all that. I'm finally out of my slide, so I will try to look through the chat. Certainly we can't answer all these questions today, but um, hopefully I wanna draw attention in the chat. I put a link there. So those of you that are can, interested in ongoing um, involvement in this effort, um, as it gathers steam, please give me your contact information. Um, and then I'll continue you know, discussions with Rob and, and see who else maybe might be interested in kind of um, sharing this with me, um, as well as on the clinical side, you know, working with with the support from those have who have gone ahead of me um, to figure out how you know how can we pilot some uh, um, approach to doing this within the UC health system um, in a you know safe, appropriate, conducive um, way, and and then how can we you know, track our outcomes, good and bad, and and continue to revise our approach. So um, in the last few minutes, and of course, anyone that needs to hop off um, can and should, can't, can't keep you here uh, involuntarily. Um, do, you know, I would, I guess I would ask anyone, um, I, I, like I said, I will go back through all of these um, chats, but any if anyone feels like they have something really pressing or important that they wanna share in the next few minutes. Um, like I, I, my biggest hope is this creates the momentum for an ongoing conversation, a concerted effort. And I think actually one, one benefit as much as I don't enjoy Zoom, um, maybe that it allowed us to get a further or um, broader reach of folks than we might've had we just done this in person. Um, so I, I can't say enough how much I appreciate everyone that's been able to join us, all the opinions um, that it brings, and especially those that have lived experience and, and those that um, were you know, brave and, and willing to share those with, that with us. Um, and anything in the, the final moments? Alexis, uh, do you think there'd be any interest in uh, producing uh, kind of a proceedings of this meeting? I I would imagine so. Um, yeah, certainly. Since I know. We've, we've got it recorded. Uh, we we might be able to, um, with some some editing, uh, produce something um, worthy of distribution, um, and and then could. Um, uh, take that as sort of a jumping off point. That sounds great to me with and with everyone, you know, we'll make sure we'll get all our presenters agreement for their involvement. Um, yeah, I think we need we need to attack this from from all angles that we can. Um, and like I said, I think it, it's beyond just trying to say benzos are bad and you have to, you have to or need to get off of them. I think it's really trying to figure out how do we have a concerted approach of educating people before we prescribe them, when we do prescribe them, if they have adverse outcomes. And, and I know that, um, I'm gonna get the name wrong, but someone pointed out, John State, um, whose name I'm familiar with as well, um, pointed out that you know a lot of people are experiencing interdose withdrawal and that 
that fear and trepidation um, can drive a lot of them to, to be leery of wanting to get off or um, be taken down on the dose. Um, so I think, I mean, this is a, a complex issue that requires a complex approach. So thank you all. Okay, if no one else has anything else to say. Um, I really appreciate it um, and uh, look forward to continuing this um, soon. Thank you, Alexis. This is wonderful. Thank you for putting this together. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Alexis. Thanks, Dr. Hoff. Thanks. Hi, Mark. Thanks, Christy. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thanks, Dee. <laughs> Thanks, Dee. <laughs> Thanks, Christy. <laughs> Are you waiting on us to drop off, Alex? <laughs> oh, no, you know, okay. I'm actually trying to figure out if there's a way for me to X, which I know there is, export the chat. Okay. Um, and I want to make sure I don't lose it before I sign off. <laughs> yeah, if there's a way to get a recording of this, that'd be great. Thank you so much for all this. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, we we will have a recording and, and the slides and um, I hope to be in touch. And thank you so much for, for sharing. And I appreciate uh, meeting or virtually listening to you at the previous meeting in, in December. So yes, it was nice to meet you then. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll probably email yeah. you and follow up. Great. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye.